Robert, thank you for joining me on Talking Energy. Been trying to get you for ages, so it's great to see you're here. Looking smart as ever. Thank always. you very much. See, smartest, smartest by name, smartest by name. Smartest guy in the room. Smartest guy in the room. Yeah, OK, we'll come to that in a moment. <laughs> Tell the audience a little bit about yourself. I mean, we've known you here at Smartest Energy for many years, but who is Robert Groves? Where did it all start? Where, where did, what's your background? OK, well, I'm uh, a nuclear engineer by training and profession. Uh, but I uh, came out of that in uh, the mid-90s, um, got an education and um, drifted into energy really uh, and started my career at Enron. And, uh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> which I thoroughly enjoyed working at. It was a great place to work. It was just a shame there was criminality at the yes. most senior level. Um, I wasn't interviewed by the FBI. I was going to say. And therefore uh, avoided jail. And. Um, then just stayed in the energy trading business since. So I've been in um, this sector in the UK largely for the last uh, 23 years. Before that, you had a bit of a, uh, I don't know, how do I put it? Uh, a fluid career. How's that? That's not bad, <laughs> is it? <laughs> yes, you're right. Uh, I was a submariner for seven years in the Navy. Um, and I was an engineer. So my role was back aft uh, manning the propulsion so I was a bit like, if you want to make an analogy to Star Trek, I was like Scotty in the engine room. Gotcha. Yeah. Talk about that, because you never meet, I have never met a submariner really? until now. Right. So what on earth, why, why go into that? Was it because you're from a military background or you just had a fascination? And also put the two together, the sort of you could, could have gone on board to you know, serve in some different way, but the engineering side. What, what, what drove you into that? <clears throat> well, uh, as a student, I had a lot of uh, expensive but legal hobbies, right. and uh, I needed someone to sponsor me. The only people that would sponsor me were the Navy or the Army. Uh, so it was either the Army fixing Land Rovers or the yeah. Navy doing something a little bit more challenging. So I went into the Navy and to fund my um, spending habits at university. And I just naturally went into the submarine service because it was, it was challenging, exciting, high growth, uh, rapid promotion, and uh, ended up as a submariner. What was it like? being a submariner. Yeah, I just can't imagine. I mean, I do some scuba diving, and that's yeah. great, you're free. But the depths that you go down when you're in a tin can, yeah. just can you explain what, that, what, what it felt like the first time you went down? Well, it's like being in a, a very cramped, all-male office space <laughs> <laughs> for a long period. Please tell me the AC was circulating. <laughs> well, yeah, for a long period of time, and um, quite deep. Well, I was on a, a particularly active submarine, so it was a very combative, stressful environment. Right. And you'd go away for uh, you know, two to three months at a time, and you'd be underwater for almost all of it. Wow. What do you think that taught you that you've taken into business? <laughs> if you're on a submarine, it's important that uh, you keep the hatches shut <laughs> and uh, the valves are all correctly aligned and you keep the core covered. Um, so it, it makes you detail orientated. Mm. I think that's the biggest thing I took away from it. Would you think that that stimulated, because you were part of the propulsion unit, you know, the Scotty, as you said, did that stimulate the, the energy choice later, or was that just completely uh, beside the point? Well, no, no, I left the Navy and I did an MBA at London Business School. Yeah. And then I was looking around for a role, and I uh, bumped into Enron, who were recruiting at the school at that time. And it just so happened that I had a skills, knowledge and experience fit that they liked and fitted in well with their culture. And uh, it worked for me. I did fit in with that culture and I really enjoyed it. And then that's how I just got into uh, uh, the new form of energy trading that was then arriving in the UK that the North American energy merchants were exporting over to the UK. What did you find that attracted you to the sector? Because some people can try, you know, a lot of people who have a military career try different things and then they find something. You seem to have, as you said earlier, gone into it and then you've stayed in it. What, what was it that A, attracted you and B, has kept you? Well, I think commodity trading, whether it's a soft commodity or a, an energy commodity, is, you know, it's, it's interesting, it's challenging, it's numerative. So the, the skills that an engineer has naturally settle very well in that. And then if you then throw in some commercial challenge and interest as well, it's quite an exciting sector to be in. And at that time in the late 90s, um, the North American energy merchants were starting to really shake up, the, first of all, the UK, then the European energy markets. So to be part of that transformational uh, 
journey was really quite an exciting place. Were to you be. based here or in the States? No, well, I was based here um, in London, but um, I got into um, global metals, and uh, so my role took me to California and uh, Pacific Northwest, arbitraging uh, metal and energy opportunities. So it was a very exciting time. And, um, I learned a lot, had a great time, and I was um, quite sorry that I had to leave Enron along with everyone else <laughs> of course. in 2001. <laughs> Is that when you joined Smartest? No. I, I joined Smartest in um, uh, 2004. So uh, I'd had a number of roles thereafter with uh, EDF Trading, right. BHP Billiton, and then I was uh, looking for another job. Uh, I just tried my own venture and it hadn't worked and I needed a real job and uh, I bumped into Smartest and things seemed to fit. I came on board then as the um, person responsible for all their trading and sales activities. The business took off and as it took off I just grew with it until I have uh, got to the position where I am today. What was it that um, interested you? Because obviously EDF, big player, and there were loads of other big major players. Smartest, with all respect at that time, must have been quite an unknown name. Yeah, it was an awful name at first. I thought Smartest Energy, <laughs> if you call yourself Smartest Anything, you're lining yourself up. You're before. lining up to be yeah, 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 shut down. down. Yeah, exactly. But um, um, it was when I joined 23 people, and it was a very, very clever idea. Uh, and uh, it was a startup environment. It was exciting. It was fun. And um, we had a very small team of highly motivated people who were, enjoyed working with each other. And it, you know, we all got a, a great buzz from it. And a lot Sounds of just like Energy Live News. It's, it's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, any startup is like that, isn't it? Yeah. Regardless no, of the true. industry you're in, any successful startup. But, but to stay and go through the ranks, many people enjoy that buzz and then move on. What, what has kept you there? Uh, well, the, uh, the continued challenge of growing this business. So today we're um, 280 people. You know, we're going to be double this size in headcount number in about three years' time. And we've matured from a, a very entrepreneurial startup to now quite a large, mature business that's got a, you know, a lot of balance sheet capital behind us. And so growing with the business has been a, you know, a very exciting professional challenge. What would you say it's, um, I mean, everyone says the word unique. Let's say odd. What's odd about Smartest Energy? What was it that said, oh, that's the blip that's different out there? When you A, first joined, and would you say it's still different out there now? Well, we are very odd. Uh, our, just, our industry collects odd people, doesn't it? it certainly does. Uh, you're, you're in our I'm, industry. I'm a prime <laughs> example. <laughs> so um, we, do, we do collect um, left brain thinkers, yes. I think. And uh, Smartest has got those in spades. So we've always positioned ourselves as a, a business which is focused on the customer. Because 100% of our business is external customer generated. Our customers walk in the doors and they can walk out of, the, out of our doors any day. So we have to fight to renew their interest. So our, our oddness, our USP, if you want to call it that, is our focus on giving our customers a good deal. And your business is one that's never been about assets. That's right. We're an asset light electricity company. Yeah. Weird, isn't it? You look <laughs> about it. If you think about it, when you started, you know, you're up against the big players, the big kind of vertically integrated uh, suppliers although that market's changing now. Yeah. Was it, wasn't it a bit odd to join something that tried to compete in a place without any assets? Yeah, I suppose it was, but look what's happening today. Now everyone is starting to say, we want an asset light approach. We're selling our assets. Our assets are no longer profitable. So yes, absolutely. It was very odd then, but you know, under the test of time and the conditions that we're now looking forward to, I think our business model is now the business model that many new players are replicating. You took that bait brilliantly. That's exactly what I want to move on to. <laughs> Future of supply and assets are one of those things that nearly everyone is talking about. Who will own them? How do you see the future of supply? Because we have definitely shifted now. Since Energy Live News started, it was the big six. It was all about procurement and that was the pathway. Now, if you look at it, it's about a much more fragmented energy sector, many more new players, 10 times more than when we started who are out there. You've got new competitors. And the big transition, I think, is well underway. So as you sit there now, having been, as you said, at the beginning and looking through the, the, the last sort of 10, 15 years, where do you see this sort of energy supply picture? Mm. 
Well, I, I, you know, I, my, I feel that we're on the edge of an energy revolution. I think um, we're looking at a revolution that could be akin to the revolution in telecoms that mobile telephony brought a, along. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that the supply companies of the future will be unrecognizable versus the supply companies of today. I think we're going to have players uh, acting in that supply market who are not yet in it today. They could be the Googles of energy in the future. It might even be car companies taking over the role of electricity companies. Because after all, if we are all going to own an electricity vehicle, who's going to then supply the electricity to that household? Is it going to be the car company or will it be what you might call a bricks and mortar utility company? Absolutely. So we're positioning ourselves for the future whereby supply companies will be radically different. It's going to be data driven. You're going to have to be more Google than utility. Yeah. You're going to be data driven. Uh, you're going to be dealing with customers who are prosumers rather than just consumers. And in that very exciting future, you know, the, the sort of companies that are successful are probably not around at the moment. Do you think that there's going to be a player who doesn't exist right now that's going to revolutionize things? So if you look at Apple, Apple came in, PCs existed, you know, computers mm. existed, and they did two things. One is they revolutionized the sort of personal computer, but they changed something which for us, all of us now, is the, is the mark of our lives, the smartphone. All he did was take a phone and then just combine everything. So do you think there's someone out there that will see where energy is right now and take the traditional bits of it and just rejig it to do something very different? To, to match our need with this kind of fragmented, you know, lots of storage that we need, electric vehicles. Do you see a big change coming? Well, look, I see, first of all, I see a very, very big change coming. I think we're going to, um, with um, decentralization of generation, the decarbonization of generation leading to more and more renewables, and the increased uh, localization of that at a smaller and smaller level, we're going to have a transform transformed energy landscape and I think the UK might be one of the first movers in that direction. So what sort of company might be serving that future? Is it, as you've just said, someone who's uh, got a platform, a process, a business model that they then say, look, we can deploy that in the electricity market? Yes, there's a real risk of that if players today don't adapt their business models and they allow that to happen to them. I could probably get the answer to this already, but I'm going to ask the question. I mean, do you think the big five now, or the big six, will still be around? Or do you think the big kind of asset-owning, vertically integrated companies can survive in this new future? Uh, no, I don't think they can survive as they are. And just look at their share price, really, to um, get a view on what the investment market thinks of their viability in the future. And what do you think? that that relates to? Is that relating to the fact that they are facing a troubled time because they've got the big assets that you talked about that actually, A, were closing down through decarbonisation, but B, no one really wants to run them anymore? Well, I think it's, um, I think they're aware of, they, you know, they're, they're as smart as we all are. Yeah. <laughs> they, they had the similar sort of view. I think it's a generally held view of the future. But we're still going to need some big generation assets, aren't we? Who's going to run them? Well, I don't think necessarily they will be the right people to own those assets. Um, and I think they're in a um, conflicted position their ability, in their ability to prepare for that new future because they uh, have a con conflict of interest where they're trying to protect their existing business models. And it will take a very brave CEO of one of those companies to turn that back on that existing business mm -hmm. and then try and reinvent at the expense of that business something that is uncertain and as yet unproven. What do you see as the big issue for the energy users of today? Do you think the big challenge is uh, their ability to sort of procure and save energy as it used to be? Or are you coming, having customers coming to you and say, Robert, I need something completely different from you, a different kind of solution for things that are coming up? Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because I think uh, electricity companies today in the UK are being customer-led. More and more customers are saying, look, I want something uh, different, which is very different to what you offer. I want you to, whether they're going to use it or not is a different question, of course, but they want uh, a far greater degree of flexibility about the way they consume and produce energy. 
which utilities in the UK today aren't that well positioned to be able to serve. So I think customers are definitely leading us at the moment. What do your customers say to you? What are they asking you for? Well, um, they ask for a variety of things. Um, because of course they're all, always, always driven by cost and they want to minimise their cost. But then in critical factors for them are flexibility for the what if scenarios. What if they build more on-site generation? What if they consume their power more flexibly? And then added to that is the, uh, the need for them to be seen to be green, to support their, their branding and their positioning. So these three things are all moving together and the latter two are becoming more and more important versus price. Smartest is an international company, is that right? No, no, we're just UK focused. But with uh, an investment from Japan, is that correct? That's right, we're owned by uh, two Japanese investors um, and we have been since we were founded in 2001. Um, we are very interested in expanding our platform overseas and we're looking at that now. What does that international perspective uh, bring? Are they hands off or do they say, look, here are things from the Japanese market which has had a huge change after Fukushima and where they are, but they're pretty much, pretty much LNG sort of driven. Uh, or are they saying, no, you know, let's see where the Europe, European market works. How do you see the international, either pressures from within or also the perspective that you might have? Well, you know, Maribeni is um, uh, a great owner for us to have. They give us everything that we've asked for. Um, their uh, backing provides us with the financial wherewithal we need to be able to act in these markets. Uh, they are very much a um, financial investor, so they manage us through the board, and as long as we keep de delivering the dividend, then they're very happy. But at the same time, they are very interested in us taking our platform and cookie-cuttering it in other mm. markets where it can be deployed. And more and more of those overseas geographical markets are starting to look like they could provide an opportunity for a business like this. Do you think that we are still leading in the energy world? The UK. Because, because it's very interesting when you go, we, we, we're always moaning, aren't we? We're all constantly moaning about how yeah. bad the sector is and all of that. And then when I uh, spent a bit of time earlier this year in Brussels and then I met some people, a lot of people still say the same thing. It may be a small market, in global sort of you know finance terms <laughs> but it's a damn important one for innovation and for almost being a test bed for, 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 for decentralized markets and the way things have gone how do you see where we are well I, I'm much more positive about the UK than some of uh, the detractors uh, when I go overseas um, the UK is frequently cited as a, a benchmark uh, a pioneer a role model um, that other markets, PJM, the Japanese market, have copied many aspects of. Um, I think with our approach from, from a regulatory perspective, from a political perspective, from a competition perspective, we are probably the world's leading energy market. Will that change after Brexit? No. What's your views on it? On Brexit? <laughs> Okay, well, I'm a... I'm well, a should we dedicate the next 15 minutes to this? <laughs> well, personally, I'm a Ramona. Yes. Ramona, okay. But um, from a business perspective, yeah. uh, I think, of course, there are some uncertainties it causes for us and our customers. Uh, some of those are manageable, some of them are unmanageable. Um, we're obviously dealing with the ones that are manageable. The ones that aren't manageable, we're holding off on or we're saying to our customers, we can't help you with that. Um, it's not impacting our investment program, so this business is continuing to invest and continuing to grow uh, regardless of the Brexit outcome. And that's one thing I wanted to say, that m talk to CEOs like yourself, nearly everyone says, irrespective of bre Brexit, we're getting on with business. And one thing that I have seen lately, and I'd like your view, has technology actually now driven change far more than regulatory pressures. So we were all waiting for EMR, you know, eight, nine years ago. Yeah. We were all waiting for government to give us signals on things like investment and, you know, whether you're going to get a feed-in tariff. I think that's shifted. What's yeah. your view? Yeah, I quite agree. I think um, technology is leading regulation. I don't think regulation can keep up with technology. Uh, I think regulation is at risk of being left behind by technology. Um, 
to give you an example of how seriously we take that um, uh, today, 25% of our staff base are now IT uh, professionals. And we're investing between 10 and 13% of our gross profit every year in capital ex expenditure related to IT. So we are quickly transitioning to becoming an IT-driven business. And the challenge I give this business is that we need to look more like Google than a utility going forward. And do you think that's the key? Well, from nearly everyone I talk to, energy is transforming into data yeah. with smart metering, with kind of managing assets, all of that. Do you see that that is really where, unfortunately, we're not skilled? We are definitely transitioning in that way, but I wouldn't say we're not skilled. Um, the utility sector is way behind <laughs> others, isn't it, compared to finance, compared to telecoms, yeah. much more adjusted to using technology to drive products. We're, we're not. We're still used to, hello, mate, here's your, here's your power, here's your meter. So there's a cultural change about data that I, I don't see there. I don't know whether you do. Well, uh, we're, we're investing in those platforms that enable us to be more data-driven than ever before. But if, you know, if you've got a, a customer, if your customer base is non-metered and you're doing it on estimates, you don't really need to change just yet, do you? Of course. Um, so I think the pioneers who are going to drive this change are not the domestic consumers, they're the, the business consumers. Um, they're going to prove the business model and then that platform, those products are going to then naturally extend into domestic consumers. So you're quite right, the utility sector has lagged. Uh, it's now having to play catch up very quickly. If it doesn't, then it will be um, replaced by someone that can do it. What do you think is the biggest challenge facing us? And what do you think is the biggest opportunity facing us in the UK? Ah, well in the I'm, energy field? Well, I'm much more optimistic than I am pessimistic. And um, I think that um, technology is going to enable uh, customers to do things differently and new businesses to offer them new products and services. So this is a commonly held view, everyone in our industry thinks it, so it's a race against time to see who guesses what that future standard and that technology will be and invests in it to get scope and scale. And I'm very optimistic about us being able to do that. I think uh, there's much more opportunity for the UK energy industry to grasp that than it is to, for it to lose it. Is there a bit of technology waiting to revolutionise the world in terms of generation? Or you know, are we still away from a, a big fusion breakthrough or something like that? Or do you think actually th the revolution is in how we stop wasting energy? Uh, well, we, OK, we're talking about energy conservation just very briefly. Um, no, I don't think it's there. I think it's in the way we generate and consume electricity. So um, we're looking at a photovoltaic-led energy revolution, and then batteries have now come on to that to make it more exciting or complicated, whichever way you want to look at it. And I think the really exciting thing about batteries is that it's um, being led by the global car industry, which is committed to um, replacing its hydrocarbon uh, technology with battery technology. So that has got global economies of scope and scale, and that is going to come into our sector. You then tie that with an a incredible uh, cost curve for PV technology as all these different technologies combine to add uh, efficiency gains after efficiency gains after efficiency gains. And I think those two things create a very, very exciting opportunity where one day we'll all be mini power stations. Every domestic home will be a prosumer. And we're preparing our business today for that future. Five to ten, let's go ten years, because you're a man who likes to think positively. <laughs> ten years in the future, how do you see the energy space here in the UK? Um, you know, ten years ago we were all thinking about big commitments for, for nuclear and big assets. It's so changed. How do you see it in ten years' time? Well, um, Will there be suppliers? Well, we've already said there'll be no coal-fired power stations. And I think we're already getting uh, that happening naturally on its own. Um, I think we're going to see the incumbents having far less of a role than they do today. We're going to see many new companies which are technology enabled, um, offering a customer proposition that means 
customers who are not naturally inclined to renew a contract with an energy provider because either they don't care about it or they don't value it as much as they do the, the brand behind their car are going to switch to those new energy providers. And I think it's going to be a very different, exciting landscape. And do if, you we, look at, if, if we just look at the people that come into our, yes. our company today, you know, these we're having no difficulty recruiting um, 20-somethings who say, I want to be in the renewable electricity industry. I'm excited about working there as much as people, kids may have been 10 years ago going into investment banking. And I think that's the point I'm trying to get to, which is the, 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 the people who are coming through now, do you think the one thing which I love about energy the most is that actually it's got a heart and a soul because energy, yeah. you know, if without it, our hospitals don't work. So there's a, there's a, a public uh, good mm. in energy, which I think is very much this sector doesn't talk about enough. But also it's now got that social conscience that young people tap into, which is the sustainability thing. Do you think that's starting to get through now that it's not just about you plug in and, and you use? Absolutely. Because uh, young people are coming out of an education system which has made them aware of climate change and the need to change the way we uh, uh, generate. Um, so they're coming, if you like, with that mindset already. And they're excited then by the technology challenge that then comes on top of that as well. So I think you know, we're, we're becoming a very exciting industry, a very rapidly changing industry. And that naturally appeals to young and ambitious people. What do you love about energy? What do I love about energy? Oh, uh, I love the, um, the complexity of it. I love the challenge of it. And that's driven about all about the change that we're undergoing. And will you still be here in 10 years' time? At Smartest. In the energy sector? <laughs> <laughs> I've never, never, ever asked a boss whether this is going to be part of a company. No, do you well, think you'll still be working in energy in 10 years? Definitely. And whether I work at Smartest, well, that's up to the shareholders of this business. <laughs> of course. Keep delivering the will. Yes. <laughs> Although there's also an, an, an alternative career going back underwater, maybe. I don't know. No, never again. Electric subs? No, never again. <laughs> Robert, thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>